Welcome to Boston Lyric Opera and welcome to the Butterfly Process Discussion Series. This is an opportunity for community learning and dialogue and engagement in inclusive storytelling. We're very glad that you are all here with us today. My name is Bradley Vernatter. I'm the Acting General and Artistic Director with Boston Lyric Opera, and I'm joined with Rebecca. Hi, I'm Rebecca. I'm the Director of Community and Learning for Boston Lyric Opera. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm glad to be here with you, too. Before we begin, um, I, I will give a brief overview and introduce a few people. Today's session will be 90 minutes. Um, this session is the birth of Butterfly through World War II, uh, the first 50 years. And this session focuses on essential questions to ground us in the work of Madama Butterfly, including the socio-political context during the time of its premiere and how that changed during and after World War II. With us today is Phil Chan, artist and author of Final Bow for Yellow Face. Phil joined um, us at BLO as a partner in developing and facilitating this discussion series um, that addresses issues, of, uh, uh, issues presented by Madam Butterfly. And Phil will be joined by Dr. Kunio Hara, Professor of uh, Music History at the University of South Carolina with um, research interests, including Puccini's operas, um, alongside our artists, uh, principal artists who are originally engaged for the original production of Butterfly. And these artists are engaging with us in this year-long process. And I want to extend and a very special thank you to these artists um, who began conversations with us in early 2021 to explore the history and legacy of this work and to create space for meaningful engagement about future productions of this piece. So as a community guest, your role today is equally important. We invite you to watch, listen, and hold space for these important conversations. I'd like to invite you to take a deep breath in, and then slowly release it, just ground in this present moment. We each come here today as people holding multiple identities from different places together in this virtual space. Now we'd like to offer a land acknowledgement for this session. Land acknowledgements are small but crucial steps towards ensuring respect and tr truth for the peoples that came before us and accountability in our community. Boston Lyric Opera acknowledges that we live and work on the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Pawtucket and Massachusetts peoples. We recognize that colonization of these lands continues to affect the original inhabitants of the land after more than 400 years. Before we invite Phil on screen to begin, um, Rebecca will introduce our community and group agreements. We acknowledge that the content of this discussion series may be sensitive, and we encourage everyone to participate and engage to the extent that is most comfortable for you. These community agreements are created to support all of us here today and hold a safe space, even though we can't see each other. The first one is to take care of yourself, honor your own boundaries, and make choices that support your well being. Practice gratitude, respect, and empathy in community. Speak from your own truth. Tell your own story using first person. I feel happy. If you're a talker, experiment with listening. If you're a listener, experiment with talking. Stay curious, ask questions to seek clarification and greater understanding. Allow for grace. We are all learning about each other, ourselves, and ourselves, and sometimes the process is messy. It's okay not to have the perfect words all the time. Acknowledge that intent is not the same as impact. A sincere intent may result in a harmful impact. Notice your connections and disconnections. Support each other through difficult conversations. And finally, stay present. Thank you for honoring these agreements today. Information about the butterfly process, including the bios of our featured speakers can be found on our website, blo.org. 
Thank you again for being here with us today. And now I invite Phil and Cunio to join us to begin the discussion. Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you so much, Rebecca. It's a pleasure to be all with all of you holding this virtual space. And I'm especially keen to kick off the butterfly process with Dr. Kunio Hara. Um, as a lot of my work uh, as an advocate, um, as a creative, um, and working with Final Bow for Yellow Face, a lot of uh, history and a knowledge of history is so crucial for us as artists in order to understand how work will land with our audiences, where it's gone as a work in the past, as well as get some clues about what the future of a work is in order to keep it alive. So this historical component is really, really critical. And that's why uh, I wanted to start off this discussion series really with a firm grasp of that history. So uh, who better than, than Kunio, who has both a background as a, a Japanese historian, as well as a Puccini expert. So my first question to you, just as a warm up, um, you know, because it's happening all across the country, um, is like, why is Butterfly one of the most popular operas in your opinion? Hello, uh, and thank you, Phil, for including me in the discussion. Before I answer the question, I'd like to um, also acknowledge um, uh, my thank, and also thank the um, staff of Boston Lyrical Opera, um, Bradley and Rebecca, um, uh, for inviting me into this discussion, and all the artists who are here, and all of the um, audience watching us, and all, uh, to have this very important conversation. And of course, Phil, for doing um, the a humongous work and service for the Asian Asian American artist uh, in this country. So the question that Phil asked me, uh, why do I think Butterfly is so popular? Uh, and I, I have been kind of thinking about this issue um, and there are many, many reasons why, and I can only tell uh, speak from my perspective. But I think there are three key components um, uh, historically. So one is familiarity. Because the opera is firmly established in the canon today, uh, we have many, many opportunities to watch and perform and listen and uh, consume this opera. And this kind of familiarity uh, breeds um, uh, this uh, sense of um, recognition um, and comfort, and that in turn reinforces its place in canon. Another element is variety, uh, because many of the uh, canonic work in today's opera companies are set in Western Europe or Europe in general. So, um, an op opera that is staged elsewhere, uh, elsewhere tend to have um, more, brings more sense of diver uh, kind of variety um, in terms of musical substance, but also the visual aspect of it. And then another one, third component is relatability. So from the perspective of um, Madama Butterfly from Chocho San, the story is about um, falling in love with somebody who turns out to be not, not so worthy. And, and this is a relatable experience. However, um, all of, you know, Modern Butterfly's opera does not exist in a vacuum. It kind of brings with it different um, historical and cultural specificity. And the opera itself resonate, has resonated uh, in different ways, in different places, in different times, and among different groups of people, even, even in the same place. So, um, so my research have kind of, I have tried to explore these you know, different ways in which Butterfly has been popular and not so popular. I think immediately right off the bat, you're bringing up this great point that this, we, we sometimes think of these works of art, you know, these performing arts as being static things. We compare them to paintings sometimes, but what, really that's not the case. As we'll see uh, throughout this conversation, even a work like Butterfly that we think is static has changed so much uh, throughout its lifetime, depending on who we are as a society. So I think one thing that would be super helpful for our audience is to frame maybe what was some geopolitical um, relationships with Asia and with Japan at the time this premiere was happening and what was Puccini tapping into in terms of the Western imagination of what Japan was at that time? Yeah, so that's a great question. And so Madama Butterfly was, um, um, came into being performed for the first time in 1904, February of 1904. Uh, Puccini started composing in 1900, around 1900. However, the source material, the uh, kind of cultural imagination about Japan was circulating in, in Europe and America um, or United States in the second half of the 19th century. And for the most part of the 19th century, Japan was, had a very limited um, kind of opportunities for cultural and uh, commercial exchange with the West for outside countries. So Japan at this time in the most through the 17th through the early first half of the 19th century was a, in a sort of isolation. Uh, only traded with limited traders from um, Netherlands and in China. 
so, so there was a very little kind of a exchange. However, that changes in the middle 19th century with the arrival of American Commodore Matthew Perry in 1853 and this uh, so-called opening of Japan where the United States kind of forced a um, trade negotiation with Japan, trade deal with Japan. Um, and other European countries soon followed and um, made these uh, uh, unequal treaties with Japan. Um, that was, uh, that provided opportunity for Japanese goods to be exported to uh, Europe and United States. These include uh, ceramics, um, furniture, material like silk later on, and um, as well as uh, cultural products, including, you know, um, woodblock paintings that was so, uh, you know, that European artists were so inspired by. Um, Japanese leaders responded to this kind of sense of crisis uh, because of this kind of sudden influx of Western um, uh, demand for trade uh, by uh, swift actions that include political reform as well as importation of Western technology, Western sciences, and other aspects of Western culture uh, in attempt to kind of um, establish itself as a uh, kind of a sort of a nation that could withstand or com be compared comparable to other Western countries. Um, so all of this was happening. Japan was rapidly westernizing, modernizing in different ways. One of the ways in which, um, so uh, that was kind of shocking and also threatening to the Western and uh, Western world was Japan's emerging as a military power. So one of the things that um, and this is called the major restoration devoted was to industrialization, but also rapid kind of a reinforcement adaptation of Western military technology. And by the late 19th century, Japan had won several wars. Uh, one important war with China in 1894 called the First Sino-Japanese War. And, and then another war with Russia in around the time of Madame Butterfly, it started in 1904 and ended in 1905, in which um, Japan defeated a European uh, nation, in this case, Imperial Russia. The consequence of these uh, political um, events were that Japan has now emerged as a uh, military and colonial power, has uh, annexed Taiwan, island of Taiwan, and um, uh, by the early 20th century, the Korean Peninsula. Uh, so, in the Western imagination, Japan, uh, you know, in the 19, mid 19th century was a fascinating uh, kind of a country with beautiful products. And by the late 19th century, Japan was emerging as this uh, threat to uh, political threat uh, against a rival in this part of uh, uh, Asia Pacific region. Um, so I, I think butterfly emerged in this very tense moment um, in the European perception of Japan, both as a um, you know, aesthetic uh, object experience, as well as this realist kind of military presence. Yeah, a, a lot of my research in, in dance, I find that in these periods where there is uh, a, a global threat or a cultural threat from an outside group, you see a rise of caricature of that group in order to justify some of the anxiety um, especially, you know, whether it's immigration or whether that's it's, you know, a, a global war outside. So, in terms of, um, you know, that that's very good context to to understand what Japanese was outside in the real world. Um, how was that mirrored on stage? What were some of the depictions of Japan and Japanese people on the Western performing arts stages? So, opera and ballet and and other theater, other mediums that. Uh, uh, you know, turn of the century audience might have had an awareness of Japan through the stage. Yes. So obviously the, these paintings, this uh, artwork, it becomes a foundation of something called the um, J um, Japanism in France and the, among the artists, but also there's a, you know, like you say, stage equivalent of this. And early on, this were more caricature-esque. So uh, de definitely what Phil you're talking about. So um, one of the uh, earliest works that kind of depicted Japan on stage was uh, Saint-Saëns' um, opera comique called La Princesse Jeanne, The Yellow Princess, from 1872. Um, and this was a uh, kind of fantastical story about a Dutch man who, uh, you know, uh, I think smokes opium <laughs> and had this uh, hallucination that this um, woman in a screen, on a, depicted on a screen, comes to life. So this, you know, this Japanese person 
supposedly Japanese individual is not even a person. It's like this image on a screen, right? So the kind of virtual existence. And of course, uh, Gilbert and Sullivan's Mikado that came out in 1885 and was notable because uh, Mikado included uh, one or two uh, Japanese songs that uh, were, has already become um, known within the West. Um, so, so these are a kind of a stage predecessor, I, I guess, um, of Madama Butterfly. But there are other literally predecessors as well. So the important um, kind of immediate inspiration that Puccini supposedly saw on stage was a one act play by American playwright called David Velasco. Now, if you're a Puccini fan, you might know, Bel well, if you're a theater you know, fan or historian, you might know Belasco's because he's kind of this American, important figure in American theater history, in kind of realist theater. And one of the one of Belasco's um, collaboration with Puccini, another collaboration with La Fajula the West, so, so this kind of opera that came right in the heels of Butterfly. But anyways, so Belasco uh, had a one act play called Madame Butterfly that was that premiered in 1900 in New York and then went to London. And Puccini apparently saw the performance of London kind of production of Butter Butterfly and immediately wanted to uh, start a negotiation. Now Belasco. Uh, not only um, Belasco had a, a source to consult, and this was a short story written by a, a kind of a Philadelphia lawyer by the name of John Luther Long, who published a story called Madame, Madame Butterfly um, in 1898. This in turn seemed to have been a response to another novel called Madame Chrysanthème by Pierre Loti, who was a French naval officer who was in Japan in the 18, mid 1880s and have this love affair um, with a, uh, a, a woman in Nagasaki. So, uh, so there are several kind of iteration of butterfly story, uh, kind of romance between a, a kind of a Western or European American um, sailor, naval officer, and a Japanese woman. Uh, what is interesting about Long's, uh, this American author who wrote the short story is that Long has a sister, had a sister whose name was Jenny Correll, and she, um, was a married to an American Methodist mission, missionary who, uh, who and together they stayed in Nagasaki for several years. And she seemed to have this direct connection and uh, conversation or story um, that she heard about this relationship between an American soldier and um, a young Japanese woman. So um, we understand Long's uh, kind, of, kind of a story, which is slightly different from the play or the opera. Uh, has some element, a kernel of kind of, you know, truth to it. So there were lots of little pieces of this story, fragments. And yeah. what was Puccini's process in synthesizing all of these into the opera we know today? So as you know, um, I think Puccini was a very practical man as a theater man of theater. And uh, he would collaborate with a lot of different people and, um, so Puccini had uh, two librettists uh, who wrote Butterfly, um, uh, Luigi Ilica and Giuseppe Giacosa, uh, with whom he also wrote La Boheme and Tosca. Uh, so so the, uh, the story is that Puccini uh, immediately contacted David Velasco to kind of secure the rights to uh, set this play as an opera. It took a, took a while for Velasco to respond. So in the meanwhile, Puccini asked his librettists to look at, you know, you know the source materials. So um, what comes out of, uh, so what the Bradis then not only studied this play, but also looked at the, uh, the short story that John Lutheran wrote and possibly um, Pierre Loti's Madame Chrysanthème and because of the many traces of Chrysanthème in the early versions of the opera. So uh, what ends up with, with Puccini is this, amalgamation of three, at least three different literary sources, as well as some musical, um, you know, I, I, I have done research on this kind of music that Puccini uses and I can talk more about it. But what is interesting is that because um, Lotti, Long and Velasco have slightly different take on the way they characterize the Japanese woman or her relationship with the Western man. Um, I think Butterfly as the original text, this libretto portion of Butterfly has this, is, can be quite incoherent. Um, there's a impulse to kind of infantilize um, Chocha-san, for example, in the especially in the first act, um, and then the impulse to make 
uh, butterfly into a very uh, mature tragic hero in the heroine, sorry, in the second half of the opera. And I think that has to do with this kind of inconsistent, not inconsistency, but this kind of a, um, the collides like nature of the text, I, I guess. Um, uh, I one thing I forgot to mention to you um, and Phil and uh, th those of you listening here is that David Belasco, when adapting the short story into a play, um, uh, cut the narrative, kind of truncated the narrative so that it really focused on this, what we think of as the second half of the opera after Pinkerton has left. So it was a long kind of a mono series of monologue uh, for um, Madame Butterfly in the play. Now, did, did Puccini have um, any authentic influences from Japan? Like, did he ever travel to Japan or, or what was his, um, I guess, from what we can piece together, what was his process of incorporating Japanese culture and, and into this work? Yeah, so in the late 19th century, European composers were, uh, you, know, you know, fascinated, you know, uh, drew inspiration from all sorts of non-Western culture. So we have, you know, you know the early example is like Bizet's Carmen, which is set in, you know, Spain, but by a Frenchman drawing on, you know, Spanish popular music and other, uh, you know, operas of this nature um, in France and elsewhere. But Puccini, um, the musical influence, so there was a kind of a practice of uh, European composers, you know, adapting um, little bits of uh, non-Western music at this time. And Puccini um, sought out um, what he thought of as authentic Japanese music. Um, and we know that by this time in the early 20th century, late 19th century, early 20th century, not only did Europeans came to Japan, but Japanese, you know, trade businessmen, students and performing artists were traveling to Europe. Uh, so uh, there's a famous um, um, a performer by the name of Sadayako, who, who used to be a geisha and then became a stage actress, um, uh, who came to, uh, who did a tour with her husband and the, the company, a troupe that um, uh, he ran in Paris. And, and, and they also went to Milan. And it's possible that Puccini may have witnessed this show. Um, and Puccini also reached out to the Japanese uh, consulate in, who were stationed in uh, Italy and um, his wife um, came up to Puccini's or came down to Puccini's villa and apparently played some music, brought a koto or a sang music. Uh, so, so, and what we know is that Puccini seemed to have acquired some sheet music um, from these sources, either, you know, um, from uh, uh, Ma Madame Oyama, the, the, the wife of the ambassador or consulate in, uh, from Japan, or um, um, uh, yeah, uh, kind of a commercially available uh, sheet music. And one important source that I think um, we have, uh, the kind of, and scholars uh, of Puccini, Butterfly has been kind of uh, busy kind of identifying where these music came from. But one of the sources that uh, likely that Puccini used was a source, a collection of Japanese songs for piano, arrangement for piano by a German composer called Rudolf Dietrich. And Rudolf Dietrich is important because he in, in fact lived in Japan. He was invited by the Japanese government um, in the 19, uh, 1890s, so about a decade earlier than uh, Butterfly, uh, to teach at the Tokyo School of Music, which is a um, uh, the kind of a predecessor of the University of Arts um, in, in Tokyo. Um, and there, in this institution, this Tokyo School of Music was established in the Meiji era in the 19th century um, to create a music education curriculum based on Western models, especially American model and Europe, and invited American school, uh, teachers and European teachers. So, um, so one of the goals of these institutions was to produce um, songbooks that uh, school children can sing, but also kind of experiment with fusing Japanese music with Western kind of a music theoretical concept like harmony. Um, so, uh, so Dietrich uh, Nippon Gakufu, which is called the Japanese music, um, uh, is a collection of the folk song, the traditional songs that he collected, or kind of a acquired from his colleagues and then uh, arranged for the piano. And Puccini uses may maybe four or five uh, excerpts from these collections into his score. And he also uses other um, 
collection of sheet music that um, Japanese um, musicians had, at this time was producing. So what is interesting here, I think, is that even, you know, you know, Puccini is using Japanese music, but at the same time, Japanese artists and kind of institutions are trying to make their music uh, legible, perhaps uh, understandable to the Western audience by transcribing into Western notation. And so this was Puccini's way of, of again, further interpreting those musics into his own style and kind of rearranging it for himself. So uh, Puccini also, uh, it, I, I read that the, the, the premiere of, of the work was initially a flop and went through a few different um, sort of edits and, and transformations, sort of the off-Broadway trial didn't go so well, <laughs> you know. So can you tell me a little bit about the various versions that, that we have and that we know of, of, of what we think of as butterflies, actually probably several different, slightly different operas of the yeah. same version. And, and, yeah, and this is a very kind of a vexing problem for Puccini scholars because Puccini again was a very practical man and he, he re revised a lot. <laughs> he would tweak things up many, many times. And Puccini's, the first version of Madame a Butterfly was famously a flop in 1904. And um, there are different theories, you know, the work itself was not strong enough or the audience were really not interested in Puccini or there's some kind of um, conspiracy against Puccini by his rival, um, you know, composers, etc. cetera. Uh, but in any case, th this was quite a shock to, to him. And he was immediately kind of came up with, um, Kind of revision. Um, so Puccini's 1904 version was in two acts. So he got, so, so we, we think of Puccini's um, butterflies as a divided three acts perhaps. Um, so the, um, in this version, the second act was what um, the, the, the scene from when, you know, we see Madame a Butterfly um, waiting for a Pinkerton and then the intermezzo with the humming chorus and then the final segment. These were all done without a break. And some opera companies still do it to the opera in this way, but um, you know, uh, the audience complained that it was too long. So he kind of split the, uh, the second half into three, into two. So we have three parts now. Um, and he also tweaks different things and he continued to do this through 1906. And by comparing, uh, you know, traces of these uh, versions and there are available through, because recording the, uh, the, the publisher uh, is, would issue a piano vocal score or score, or orchestral score at each kind of iteration. So there are different versions that we can trace. Um, and so what we think, so, so if you study these different versions, we, uh, we immediately understand, see that um, some of the, some of in, during this process of revision, um, the blatantly or obviously kind of racist comments that Pinkerton would make in earlier version of the opera against the Japanese, Japanese servants or Japanese relative is kind of eliminated over the course. And, and several co comedic section in the first act is eliminated um, involving the drunken uncle. And, and the second act, however, the second part, however, I'm sorry, the third act rather, um, Pinkerton inserts a, in a beautiful lyrical aria for Pinkerton, Adio Asolito Asil, which is a, a kind of rare moment we see that Pinkerton might be a little bit remorseful <laughs> and therefore redeemable. So in the process of the revision, we kind of see how the character of Pinkerton changes a lot from this callous kind of a unfeeling kind of a arrogant man into a more of a stereotypical romantic hero or tenor. So a little bit more nuance there for, yeah. for the American character. Yeah. Um, and then of course there were, there were some, um, you know, I assume all of the first performers of Butterfly were all Europeans. Yes. Um, and when did Japanese singers start to kind of take ownership of, of the opera itself? Yeah, and, and that's the fascinating thing about the history of, of Modern Butterfly is that the participation of Japanese and Asian and Japanese American, Asian American singers begin rather quickly. So one of the earliest um, performer, Japanese singer who became a star in Europe, her, her name was Tamaki Miura, and she started uh, performing Madame Butterfly in 1915. So that's within like 10 years of the premiere of the opera. Um, and she, she you know, make a splash in uh, England and then later in the um, United States. And, and within Japan, there's some kind of, um, um, different versions. Uh, for example, um, Jap there, there was an important uh, production by the Japanese Japan Music Drama Society um, 
which was led by Kosaki Yamada, a very important composer, um, he produced a, a, in 1930 a bilingual uh, production of Bottom Butterfly in Tokyo, in which he was sung in Japanese and English uh, in this realistic kind of a casting with Japanese singers for the Japanese like, role and uh, European singers for the American roles and then um, edited out some of the problematic element of the, the text as well as music. Great. So I'd like to, speaking of Asian and Asian American singers, would like to invite some of our artists who are, are involved in this process to turn their cameras on and join us. And just, we're, we're just gonna have a five minute lightning round, just a quick uh, question of, of, since we're talking about different productions of Butterfly and how it's changed through history, perhaps maybe you guys can give us some notes on, from the field of if you guys have seen any sort of, um, you know, non-standard versions of Butterfly or either sung in them or seen them or just how have you seen other ways that other creative directors have interpreted this work? I'd actually like to jump in first if that's all right, um, mostly because I kind of got a surprise fact here when you mentioned the Jap Japanese Music Society's version in 1930. Uh, the uh, version I was going to bring up was a um, a production that was a collaboration between Pacific Opera um, Project and Opera in the Heights, which also did the bilingual uh, using Japanese um, Japanese singers to sing the Japanese roles and English singers to sing the English roles. And I thought that I didn't get a chance to see it, but online you can find um, their uh, their after show panel talks, talking to the artists about how they appreciate that and how they made a bigger connection because now you're singing in your native language versus singing in Italian and working with that kind of culture shift. So I was started smiling when you said that that happened in 1930 as well. So it's kind of fun to see it, how it keeps evolving and coming back around again. I'll go ahead and jump in. Oh, sorry, Nina. <laughs> I was just going to say, um, because that was actually the one that I was actually going to bring to the table as well, the Pacific Opera Project, because one of my dear friends um, was in it singing Goro, and that character specifically was then serving as a translator, which I thought was a very interesting take on that. Um, oh, also, and we are being reminded to introduce ourselves. So my name is Melanie Bacalling, pronoun she, hers. I'm a Filipinx American um, and a former emerging artist with Boston Lyric Opera in addition to other roles that I've had with the company. Um, so excited to be here. Um, but I'll bring up another uh, uh, production since Jack already talked about that one. Um, Welsh National Opera, I believe, recently did a version um, where they take out all cultural reference, um, Japanese reference uh, in general. I haven't um, been able to see it, but it was just one that um, I had heard about recently as well. Hi, I'm Naimi Yoshida Nelson. I'm a mezzo-soprano, and um, I wanted to talk a little bit about a production that I heard of that took place in uh, fall of 2019 um, by a well-known Japanese director in Tokyo. And um, as far as I know, it hasn't come to the United States yet, but it starts with uh, Pinkerton on his deathbed um, with his grown-up son, Dolore Saro. Um, and he basically is saying, I want to tell you the story of your mom and um, and some of the mistakes that I've made in my life. And um, so you watch um, Butterfly kind of as a memory and um, the grown up uh, sorrow is on stage throughout the whole show, watching as his father uh, talks about uh, all the mistakes that he made in his life, including Madame Butterfly. I'll just try to get a mic, my quick few moments here. I'm Zach Borchevsky. I'm uh, uh, singing Pinkerton in this uh, process. Um, I don't have Delore here, but I have a different uh, little baby who was uh, un un unexpectedly foisted upon me. No, he's, he's the best. This is Charlie. He's not going to stop his, his little whining. But anyway, I uh, saw a production at the Teatro Real, not in person, but rather uh, streaming. It was set in 1930s. Uh, as as in a uh, as if it was a production of the opera being filmed by the uh, relevant Spanish film company, um, and so it to me is is like the ultimate cop out attempt to deal with the issue of yellow face and casting a bunch of white singers because it's like pretty much all white people on all of the chorus and all of the main roles. And they sort of did some subtle yellow face makeup, but not like extreme. Um, but it was like their way of justifying it was like, oh no, but we're not doing it. We're just showing how they would have done it in the 1930s 
if they were doing it then. And so to me, it was like, <laughs> okay, I, I appreciate that you're trying to do something to deal with the awkwardness of Yellowface in the modern age, but it seems like kind of a huge cop out rather than addressing the, the core uh, concern of Yellowface. They're just kind of sweeping it under the rug by saying, we used to do it. So we're just going to show you how it used to be done. And, you know, it's kind of unfulfilling to me. It's okay. It makes me cry too, baby. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for that, that artists. Um, I guess wanted to switch gears and, and think about um, sort of the, the next big moment in our history, um, which is sort of the conflict with Japan in World War II and, and the sort of Pacific War um, that happened after, as a result of the bombing of, of Pearl Harbor. Um, and just curious, both having the historical context around that, that political event um, and then how it influenced uh, how we viewed Japanese people and Japanese culture and, and how Japanese culture uh, has since rehabilitated itself, um, both in general society as well as on the opera stage. So can you walk us through um, exactly what, what happened um, you know, during the Pacific War? Yeah, thank you for that. And, and thank you also for the other artists that commented. I, I would love to come back to some of the points that you mentioned, um, brought up. But the, the, this kind of military buildup that I referred to earlier in the presentation come to a head, right, in the 1930s and 40s. And the kind of um, performing history of modern butterfly has this tremendous impact. We experienced a tremendous impact during World War II, or more precisely between in the Pacific War phase, so uh, after the Pearl, bombing of Pearl Harbor and end of the war in 1945. So um, butterflies seem to you know, uh, be performed regularly in Europe. However, in um, United States and Japan, uh, the performance of Madame Butterfly kind of shuts down in, after 94, in the December 1941, after these two countries go into war. And there is no official ban that promulgated by this, uh, the, the state. Uh, in other cases, you know, Japan did ban um, musical uh, expression products from the allied nations, but you know, Italy and Japan was allied. Um, um, but after World War II ends in 1945, the opera is immediately embraced by both parties in both, in both Japan and United States. And when, when this happens um, in the United States, um, you know, the critics who are writing about the revival of uh, Madame Butterfly in 1945 and 46, you comment how much they missed hearing Madame Butterfly and how much they, um, and, and they kind of speculate about why this was the case. And one of the prominent reasons I thought this is also fascinating is that the reason why um, there was this kind of, um, resistance or hesitancy to produce modern butterfly during the war years was that the opera depicted an American soldier um, in a negative light and also kind of uh, designed to uh, elicit empathy or sympathy for the Japanese characters. And this apparently was too much for the general American public. You know, of course, we have to remember um, there was an enormous tide of anti-Japanese sentiment or anti-Japanese American sentiment in the United States. And this, many Japanese Americans on the West Coast were interned in concentration camps. And this was a tragic time for the Japanese American community. And so, so there's a kind of a parallel event that was happening on the operatic stage. And the revival of Butterfly only comes out after, it coincides with the reintegration of Japanese American um, people within the American mainstream American society. Um, in, in Japan, another interesting aspect of this is that um, when Madama Butterfly comes back on stage in 1945, late 1945, 46, Japan was still under the American occupation. So allied powers, including America, occupied Japan from 1945 to 42. So, uh, sorry, 1945 to 52 for a while, long time. And um, they did, you know, they, and uh, opera companies kind of seize on this opportunity to make money uh, by uh, providing entertainment for the American troops. And they would entertain, uh, put on shows such as the Mikado, as well as uh, Madama Butterfly for the American troops and their family and the officers and their families and government um, officials there. 
So Butterfly became something that sort of a calling card that represented Japan, that yes. Japanese, Japan wanted as a, as a way to, to associate with, with their country, even though it was not something native from Japanese culture. Well, yeah, I think it's, it, it, there's, you know, it's, it's hard to say the country as a whole has embraced modern butterfly, but what, what is ironic, not perhaps ironic, but uh, fascinating here is that um, the kind of colonial relationship that was depicted in modern butterfly has become the kind of norm in Japan during this occupation years. Um, and this kind of liaison between American soldier, GIs and Japanese women were happening all the time, right? In, in real life, and you have this on stage. And um, there, um, if you read really old um, opera news from the 30s and 40s, there are you know, letters from the, the viewers, letters from the readers. Um, and some of the letters contains are actually written from Jap American GIs who are stationed in Japan. And they're writing back to the Metropolitan Opera saying that I listened to the radio broadcast of Madame Butterfly uh, here in Tokyo or here in Nagasaki, I'm, you know, I'm exploring the landscape that is depicted in the opera. So it, it seems like um, Butterfly was in the mind of you know, many American people and how they understood the new relationship with the Japan. And uh, you know, now as we've moved through the 20th century and we're now into the 21st century, the opera has, is now over a hundred years old, um, which you know, sometimes we, we we think of these masterpieces and these classics and these sort of pieces of high art. And we think of something that is old, you know, Shakespeare is, is 400 years old. Um, and, and somehow we put Butterfly, which is just mm -hmm. barely a hundred years old in the same category as something like maybe A Midsummer Night's Dream or Macbeth. So um, what are some newer versions, uh, you know, as, as the operas continue to change throughout the 20th century and, and into the 21st, what are some other interpretations that you've come across of how this text has been treated. Yeah, and, and so this is a kind of a relatively new area of my research. I'm still learning a lot and I'm, I'm really interested to listen to the, uh, what the experiences of the artists here too. Uh, but um, starting quite early on um, after, the war, after World War II, um, uh, European and American opera companies begin to kind of, um, pay attention to the Japanese artist rendition of Madame Butterfly. So in 1950 and 1952 and 53, a Japanese opera company called the Fujiwara Opera Company um, tours in US and also in 56. And they bring an interesting, uh, uh, and I think Jack, you appreciate this. They also bring a bilingual production of Madame Butterfly. Japanese singers are performing Japanese role in Japanese and American singers singing um, or you know, local singers singing um, uh, kind of American role. Um, and they also significantly enough had a, a co-production of modern, bilingual Madame Butterfly Butterfly with New York City Opera in the early 1950s, right? Um, and the director who was involved with uh, Fujiwara Opera Company, he didn't come to the tour, but he worked with this opera company in Japan um, and is then invited to direct and produced the Metropolitan Opera version of Madame Butterfly. And his name was, uh, you might, many of you here might, or listening here might know his name, Yoshie um, Aoyama. Um, and he, his 1958 production of Madame Butterfly uh, was inspired or kind of informed by the Japanese theatrical tradition, um, design, etc. cetera. And uh, oh, they're very, uh, and this was touted as the most authentic <laughs> Madame Japanese authentic Jap Madame Butterfly in 1958 at the Met. And this production kind of lives at the Met until the 1980s or 1990s, quite a long time. Um, so there was this interest initially in the 1950s and 60s uh, with Japanese artists, right? And then more recently, there's kind of revival or uh, second generation or this uh, more interest among to uh, engage um, Asian American and Japanese American artists as well. So the most recent one that I've seen um, that I think Jack, you mentioned, um, was the Pacific Opera Project and Opera in the Heights um, co-production of my Bilingual Modern Butterfly. Another interesting one I, I saw personally was the Heartbeat Opera in New York in 2017 production 
which is just titled Butterfly, and they the uh, company kind of cuts the narrative uh, kind of in a very you know, small segment, um, but focuses on you know the the kind of a psychological emotional uh, uh, growth of Georgia San Madam Butterfly, but also it really highlights this idea of uh, what it means to be um, um, by by uh, racial by cultural uh, in terms of. Uh, uh, Dolore, and as well as the obviously explicit, you know, they highlight and foreground the imperialist co uh, component of the opera. A, a very interesting production. Uh, another one is La Scala, production nineteen in twenty sixteen. So uh, Ricardo Shari uh, has been kind of doing really interesting production of uh, Puccini lately there. And uh, they decided to produce the original version of Madame Bob Butterfly that had opened at La Scala in 1904 and was booed and was never played there again. Uh, so this was a revival of that very first production. And, and th there's a DVD available. I, had, I haven't seen the, uh, the production in person, but I studied the DVD. And it is fascinating because it brings out all of the, the obviously kind of a racist uh, kind of a expression and attitude that uh, Pinkerton holds against Japanese people, Japanese culture, Japanese food culture um, to the fore, right? And then there's race, obvious racial caricature. He does not get the aria at the end. So, um, so he, it, it gives a really interesting kind of a um, uh, lesson or rather a look into the, what the opera, how up different the opera was. And yeah, so, so the, these are some of the interesting um, or notable ones that I've um, seen or read about lately. Yeah. But I think yeah. most importantly, I think the, the, uh, what is fascinating, what's exciting right now uh, about Butterfly Butterfly is that many, many Asian and Asian American musicians are uh, actively kind of um, bringing their experience on stage and trying to uh, kind of uh, connect with the audience, but also highlight some of the historical uh, issues that is connect, you know, is that opera embodies and without ignoring it or without kind of uh, sanitizing it, just bringing it to the fore. And I think that's a, a, a exciting way to think about this opera. So it seems like this opera, even from the very early start, uh, even though it may have started out being a Eurocentric portrayal of Japan, was quickly adopted by, you know, Asian artists or artists of Asian descent and, and trying to find ways to include them. So either through casting or through directing or through creating bilingual experiences. So one of the things that, that comes across a lot in my work is, you know, when you're trying to pay homage to a culture, but if you're not including people from that culture's input or their thoughts, that, that's when you have a case of appropriation. So seeing so many Asian artists um, grappling with this work from a very early time um, shows that there's a lot of potential for Butterfly to be a multiracial work or to, to be seen through more than just one specific lens. So I think that's particularly why um, I think BLO in this time is, is interested in chewing on this discussion and also why we have some mixed feelings about how, how this work is done and it's complicated and messy. So um, it, it has both been a you know, we, we had some sessions with the Asian Opera Alliance and, and a lot of Asian singers had said that it was both a gateway for them to having a career in opera, but also something that has pigeonholed them into just singing, you know, the Asian role. So it's, uh, it's a little bit more complicated than just say, well, we shouldn't do it anymore um, or we should keep it the way it is. So I um, wanted to use this opportunity now to bring the artists back um, and to just talk a little bit more with now with having this, this history um, and this context to draw from, um, does this change your thoughts on Butterfly or does anyone wanna share an experience of, of how this history might inform a future way of thinking about how you approach the characters depicted in this opera? I'm really interested uh, in learning more from Professor Hara because I, I'm so glad that somebody is here who uh, has studied the history and, and uh, knows so much about it. I don't know if you know about the actual process of revision as much, but that sounds very interesting from uh, coming from the perspective of somebody singing Pinkerton and what I decided about what I think the character is from the score. Um, 
were, do you think the revisions, I mean, lots of racism in the original, you're saying lots of, uh, I mean, he, he has no enduring characteristics. How much of that change revision do you think was uh, due to, um, for dramatic reasons, Pinkerton, like not being a compelling character, first of all. And so why would anybody want to watch just a racist being racist? That's kind of boring. Um, and also it kind of lowers the, um, I mean, it makes butterflies of uh, like being in love with him seem a little ridiculous and it like reduces her uh, agency as a person. Like why is she falling in love with this? He's racist. Um, so uh, were those the elements or was it uh, the third element that could also of course be in there is Europeans don't want to watch themselves being racist. <laughs> they don't want to see um, them, their culture portrayed in a negative light. So, I mean, do you have any evidence in terms of letters or any evidence of why he was uh, changing uh, the, the role of Pinkerton? Yeah, I cannot talk about the, the kind of uh, intent, <laughs> the kind of behind these changes, but I, I do think that, but, but I think you're right about, um, you know, one concern must have been, you know, you want this opera to be popular and you, you, you expect certain things tenors you know romantic lead should embody certain things and you know this character was out of kind of character <laughs> and, and you want it to be more stereotypical um another interesting so addition of aria is interesting right because um um do you know uh, you might know um Puccini's first opera Le Villi. um this was a one act you know originally one act turned into two act during the process of revision um, Puccini also added a remorseful aria for the main, main lead character, Roberto. So this has seemed to have been this kind of a um, demand to, for aria for, you know, tenors, right? Um, so that's part of it. And, um, and, 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 and uh, but I, I, another thing is that, so many of the details that Puccini draws or his libertist draw in the first act, you know, he describes um, his um, servants in unkind manner. He talks about the strange, well, to him, very strange food, Japan. This also all seemed to come from Pierre Loti's novel, uh, Madame Chrysantem, which is blatantly kind of, I mean, Phil and I talked about this. It's kind of surprising how bad this is because throughout the novel, the character compares Japanese people to insects, um, animals, objects. Um, so butterfly is part of that, right? So, he, you know, rather than calling somebody a frog or, you know, goat, she's a butterfly. <laughs> so, 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 so that it kind of comes from that. And Madame Chrysanthem means um, Madame um, Chrysanthemum. But all, at the same time, um, there are women in Japan who are named Kikusan, which is, you know, Chrysanthemum. So you know, Japanese women are often named after um, flowers, you know, at this time, um, some, some of them. Um, so there's some authentic cultural nod to that, but um, yeah, so I think in the process of, um, like you say, Zach, rationalizing this character to become, you know, make it more dramatic, compelling, I think it was, under, it was um, uh, inevitable, perhaps, that this kind of uh, un, unkind nature of Pinkerton to be kind of rounded off. And I, I, yeah, so, so, yeah, I, I do, this is a difficult job for you because <laughs> the character, you have to kind of build it to make it believable. Well, um, yeah, my, my interpretation has been just from the text uh, is, is that uh, Pinkerton has his own idea of how Japanese society in this way is operating. And he believes, this, this is my own personal thing, you can take it or leave it, that, um, that Butterfly is in on, like she understands that this is a more prostitution style relationship. And that the fact that we need to pretend that it's a marriage is like the way that they do it culturally. And maybe that's what Goro has told him, or maybe that's just what he believes. And that's what his, his arrogance is, is wrapped up in that um, belief that he understands. And, and he can mansplain to, Sharp, sharpless and everybody about how this works. And this is, it's how it works. And that also allows the remorse to make sense because if he just genuinely knew that she was a victim as opposed to a complicit in this existing society and like, okay with it, not necessarily like totally gung-ho, still a sort of an oppressed 
um, gender happening there, but uh, at least she knows. And I think his remorse comes out when he discovers that she doesn't actually, she wasn't, she, she thought it was marriage. <laughs> she thought this was it. Like she didn't, she didn't understand this whole uh, just coming in, drop an anchor for a little while situation. Anyway, that's, that's how I justify it to myself because you can't play a monster and just like be cool with that. But I think it's also interesting because in the, in the Lottie novel, there is some awareness that Butterfly is in on it. Um, so again, that is another change. It sounds like that Puccini decided to make it, make the turn up the tragedy by saying, actually, no, she doesn't know. But in the novel, it's it's quite clear that she's she's sitting at the end of the novel counting the money. And she she knows she knows what the arrangement was, um, regardless of what the emotions projected were. Yeah, and, and Phil, and that's an important, I mean. Uh, also a shocking scene in the novel when you come to that because in the Pier Lottie version it, it is actually the the European man um the French naval officer who comes back to the scene you know to th think that maybe she was in fact in love with me and I'm actually in fact loving with her and then she he realized that this was all a dream right um and then so it so uh, uh, John Luther Long's novel seemed to have Chrysanthem in the mind, and because Pinkerton think, oh, I'm going to have this quote unquote Japanese marriage. This is how it goes, right? So, and then, and then the tragedy there is that, uh, you know, Chocha-san perhaps was in on it, but then changes her mind or have a more complicated relationship with uh, Pinkerton that creates a misunderstanding. Yeah. But all of this is kind of. Um, um, predicated on this unequal relationship, gender relationship, also kind of national racial relationship between European man and Japanese woman. So yeah, that's part of it too. I have a question for Dr. Hara. Um, I'm, so I've been in over 150 um, <laughs> Madam Butterflies over the years, um, and I'm a co-founder of the Asian Opera Alliance. And so I'm really heavily invested in this opera that I love dearly. Um, and something that I am interested in that I hear a lot, but I've never really heard discussed um, so much is that supposedly in uh, I'm Japanese American, fourth generation, um, what we see as problematic here in the United States is not seen as problematic in Japan. And I would love to hear more about the way that butterfly is viewed um, in Japan versus here in the United States. Of course, of course, I'd be happy to talk on this issue because this is one of the you know research point that I'm really curious about. Um, so uh, you know, uh, reviews of early production suggest that butterfly was kind of ridiculed in Japan very early on in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s. Um, this is because these productions were either you know kind of a parody version of it or um, put on by traveling Euro uh, European companies from Russia um, or from Italy. And they have this hodgepodge costume, not set design was not great. Um, and the vision of Japan, of Japanese people, they presented on stage looks so really you know, ludicrous to the Japanese audience, they kind of laughed it off, right? And it is through the work of Japanese artists such as Tamaki, Mira Tamaki and Yamada Kosaku, who really tries to engage with this work in a very serious manner and try to elevate it into something that can be understood and appreciated by Japanese audience by either paying attention to the costuming, the kind of, you know, using real kimono, real health, you know, this observing certain kind of hairstyles. And then Tamaki was very important, uh, kind of, uh, she, she talks about while well, in her autobiography and how she worked in European countries, how she would, you know, try to bring kimono from Japan so she, it doesn't look weird and how she would um, subtly changes the gesture of the, uh, the walking gesture or bowing gesture, all of these, um, the way you com comport yourself in a more authentically Japanese way or arranging, a, you know, the wedding scene has always been a problematic because it is a kind of weird ceremony and it does not really exist in real life. And it's, it's kind of a imaginary thing, uh, but trying to incorporate element of Japanese kind of um, actual wedding ceremonies like drinking no sake or having a shinkan uh, say something, right? So, um, so, 
these kind of subtle, uh, so, so the reason why the opera is not problematic in Japan is not because Japanese people don't care about, you know, the cultural authenticity, it's that Jap Japanese artists, performers, directors, producers, costumers, designers have been working really hard over the decades to make it more kind of suitable, more culturally appropriate for the Japanese audience, right? I think that's, that's my kind of a simple answer to this. Um, and I think um, because of that, the Japanese opera singer, the kind of musician who grew up in this environment, kind of look at the opera and say, wow, this is a great representation of Japanese culture because partly because of that. And, and it becomes this um, a repertory, a kind of work within the repertory. Otherwise they will have to kind of embody a foreign kind of a character. But in this opera, they could be themselves. They could see themselves in this opera in, in a certain way. And this is, that, that discussion is very different here, right? Because um, the experience of Japanese people in Japan, Japanese music in Japan, the experience of, of Asian American singers in US is very different, right? So, but these are some of the issues, I think. I think also to build on that idea, um, in Japan, when you are Japanese, you're a member of the majority. Yep. And so the art is centered on your experience. Yep. All of the art caters you. So you're used to seeing Asian good guys and Asian bad guys, you know, Japanese, funny Japanese, sad Japanese, fat Japanese, short Japanese, tall, you know, all sorts of, and it's, it's just one other character in a, you know, big array of other representations. Whereas if you're Asian American in the United States, you're living in the minority and you're looking at the opera canon and, and there aren't as many works by well-known Japanese composers compared to if you were Japan, in Japan and you could go see art by Japanese people everywhere. Yeah. Um, in the United States, that's not always the case, especially in these sort of high art venues where certain art forms are, are seen as more legitimate or, or worth more or grander um, than, than others. So I think that's something for the audience to think about too, is that, that um, the Asian American experience and the minority informs how we have a relationship with this work in relation to all of the other repertory and all the other choices that we have to consume in our media as well. Um, any other artists have some questions? I know there's probably not an answer to this, but I'm really curious as to when companies do decide to do the original production with the more raw version of Pinkerton. I just from, I, I just wanna know, is it considered more successful? <laughs> And is it considered more successful in different countries rather than here? Like um, you mentioned earlier, uh, the, the production from the Met from 19 that went into the 80s being considered the most authentic production. And I suddenly started trying to wonder, I was like, where did we draw? Where was the line decided that that was going to be authentic? Is it because it's the timeline of when the opera was supposed to be taking place or which version was it? And and for some reason, I started relating that to a bunch of different things about authentic Latin food, because that's where my brain went with what that means. So, Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, authenticity, authentic is a very, you know, fraught word, and it can mean different things for different people, right? And and I think you're right that the, op the opera has multiple versions, so we don't really know what's authentic or what's, there's no urtex, in, in other words, right? Because Puccini is, I, I, again, a very pragmatic composer, um, and um, uh, so the the version, uh, as far as I understand, from the 1958 version was um, the 1907 kind of Paris version, right? The standard version, um, but the staging was, you know, done with American, uh, sorry, Japanese um, artists participating, and this kind of push for authenticity was something that the Metropolitan Opera kind of promoted in their advertising campaign and kind of a uh, opera news articles and, and, and they had made, made a big deal that this is um, a very authentic representation of Japanese culture, right, in 1950s. And I think there's more kind of context for that for most American audience members. By this time, there's massive number of American troops that went to Japan, <laughs> came home, so they have some cultural experience. Their products are, you know, Japanese movies coming to US, Japanese, a uh, bit of food culture perhaps coming to US. Um, uh, so, so I think, you know, beyond the Japanese American community, there's uh, more awareness of what Japanese culture is and there's more demand for, you know, it should look more authentic, et cetera. And that was the selling point at this time. 
And I, I do not mean to say that the, the production then was, you know, truly, you know, culturally authentic, appropriate. It's just that it is uh, uh, the opera company kind of embraced this idea of being authentic in the 50s. I have a general question, you know, maybe not just for Cunio, but for any of the other artists. So at what point does a work like Madame Butterfly become a product of the culture that it's depicting, even though it originally didn't come from that culture? So um, sometimes we even forget that Butterfly is actually a product of Italian culture, you know, um, but we, we, we just so strongly identify it as something that is culturally Japanese um, and, and probably in large part due to the efforts of art, Japanese artists making their own really bold stamp on this work. But at what point does a work transform from being something about those people over there to being something about all of us together? You know, um, I think that that is not an easy question to answer, but I think it starts in something you had mentioned earlier, Phil, about who is telling the story and how do we move towards a more multicultural version of this story, but also many other stories in the opera canon. Um, and so to me, it seems like if we are engaging using the word authentically, um, with multiple voices, with Japanese voices in telling this story, um, that that is where it at least starts. Um, and, and also just saying it to answer a question that you had thrown at us earlier of, you know, our initial reactions and, and has any of our perspectives changed um, on this work based on everything Dr. Hara has been um, telling us today. Um, I know that Something that you also mentioned in your book, Phil, is which shameless plug, everybody required reading should be final bow for yellow face. It's an excellent, excellent read. Thank you, Phil, for all of your work with that. Um, but something that you do mention is how easy it is for us to write off something as racist or appropriative um, and then dismiss it and not actually do the work to discover why we should continue doing it. Um, and it's knowing this history from the base zero um, that helps inform us of like, where was it coming from in its time and space? And what is our time and space now that puts it in a relevant cultural context that makes it worthy of a story that should be told today? Um, I don't know if that actually answers the question, but those are all the thoughts that I have in my head right now. Thank you, Melanie, uh, and also for Phil for this um, question. And it, it really becomes, you know, the question of who, who owns the culture, right? I mean, can, can, we, can anybody own a cultural product? I mean, yes, Puccini has a copyright <laughs> and recording product owns a copyright still. But, but you know, uh, in terms of representation, the what is represented on the stage and, um, you know, who, who gets to say what, this is ours, this is not yours, it, it's a, becomes a difficult issue and and this um the discussion of um and this that I'm, I'm i'm saying this as a japanese person as you know can, can i can, can i claim I, do i want to claim bottom of butterflies as a japanese work or do my you know other people in japan want to claim it as a japanese work and um i, I think some people do think you know kind of have a very strong attachment to it um you know i i have I do, I, my, my academic career is kind of partly based on the, the discussion of this work. So yes, I, I'm very invested in understanding the history of this work and how it's performed. And I have very interest in how it will be performed later on. Um, so I, I'm just rambling. I don't know why I'm, <laughs> if I'm Well, you actually, you, you bring up a good point is, is I guess, what do you see? And maybe this is a question for the artists in the field too, but what do you see as the future of Butterfly, knowing now the trajectory that this work has gone through and all of the revisions and changes and new perspectives and new influences that this work has, you know, built and changed, you know, since its premiere? What, um, what is the future of this work as you see it? So, uh, in addition to uh, in addition to working with this role in this process with Boston Lyric Opera, I'm also currently the chairperson of an idea committee that's working with multiple unions with Boston Lyric Opera to make sure that 
as we are producing more shows in the future, that we're inclusive, we are mindful of diversity and equity and accessibility. And uh, the goal for that is to kind of come up with a framework that BLO can follow and hopefully eventually other houses can follow to make sure that they approach these rehearsal spaces and these productions with the goal of, honestly, the goal of being respectful. Um, and as I was listening to Dr. Hart earlier talking about authenticity and how it's such a fraught word, I think my, my goal and my hope for this entire process is that we find a way to do these productions, not necessarily authentically, but whatever version that we decide to work on, we are at least respectful. And that means doing these, this historical analysis, that means acknowledging the different versions, that means uh, if we're able to, and that's the goal of that particular production to bring in more Asian American singers, or if it's the goal of the director to go in a whole different direction and use that, that love story that we all, for the most part, crave <laughs> and portions in our lives, that we can also move away from the standard productions, but still be respectful of the history of the opera and the singers that we're using and respect their views on it. Um, yeah, so I just, yeah, that would be what I want for the future of opera is that we can continue doing all these productions, no matter the history that they've had, no matter how we've misunderstood it, but to understand that there are respectful ways of going about it in the future and there are opportunities to educate us as performers and the creative staff and the administration, but also the audience as well to include everyone to know that there's a history behind it. And now we can also enjoy this version that we are deciding as a group to put on. Um, I'd love to throw an idea in there as well. Um, so we have about 200 um, Asian identifying people in the Asian Opera Alliance, and we've done a bunch of discussions uh, about Madame Butterfly. And the one thing that I've come to learn is that we all have different lines on what we find is appropriate or appropriation or offensive or, um, you know, what I think is offensive is completely different from what Phil thinks is offensive. And, and so with that, we all have to learn how to respect each other. And, um, and I think the most, um, most important thing for me is that we're doing the education around around these shows and, and what it means to be living in these cultures. I think, um, you know, oftentimes our first, um, our first thought is, well, let's just cancel it. Let's just erase it. It's too, it's too dangerous to produce. It's too, we might be met with too much, uh, too much, uh, you know, backlash if we, if we produce something like this, but are we doing any good to anybody by erasing this? And I think like for me personally, it's about how can we make these productions, Butterfly or anything else, respectful and educate and learn from our past so that we are making sure that some of these mistakes that we've created in the past are not then created in the future. Go ahead, Omar. Yeah, I just have a quick question um, to to both you and Dr. Hara. Um, so uh, when, when my colleagues at the start of, of this discussion, several folks talked about different sort of unconventional productions of Butterfly, one of the things that came up uh, was a production in which the Japanese setting and all references to it were entirely removed from it. And I'm curious uh, in what your thoughts are on is is that progress or is that doing the opposite i i because I, I, I think similarly that that approach to me feels like okay it takes away the potential of meeting a lot of backlash but it also sort of sidesteps the whole thing altogether by just resetting and i was thinking of separate from butterfly i was i was aware of a production of the Mikado that was done recently that was set in Montana and totally removed the context. Of course, that's a very different piece than, than Butterfly is. I feel like Butterfly is built with a, a more earnest attachment and connection to, to the setting. So, so I'm curious what your feelings are on what it means to, to remove the story from its, its setting. 
Nine, and maybe this is a, something we can share from our experience with the Asian Opera Alliance conversation, but one of the, one of the questions we posed to this group was, is there anything um, culturally specific about butterfly that it has to be Japanese, regardless if you said it in the future or the past or whatever, is there something inherently Japanese that Puccini captured in the work, even if it was based on this, fantasy, this European fantasy? Was there anything there that was real? And that felt um, felt real, um, and I, I think that there, the overwhelming consensus was that there was something specific about Japanese ness that is in there, and that it's almost impossible to divorce that that essence of of Japanese ness, whether it's little musical cues, whether it's just the dynamics of of the situation, whether it's the colonial imbalance of the power dynamics of of who, who the countries are in that equation, that there's something inherently Japanese that is in it. Um, I don't know, Naina, if you want to, to elaborate on that, or, or Kunio, if you have anything to respond to that, but that was a, a large consensus from this group was there was, couldn't quite put our finger on it, but there was something definitely there. Yeah, I think, you know, that was, that was one of the biggest things was like, it is very, there are little bits of, and would it take away from the story if we did take away all of Japanese culture and identity? And for me personally, yes. Um, but then that comes into a whole different, you know, <laughs> discussion um, that I am always interested in. Is it, you know, in the United States, often what we do is we'll have, instead of having a, a Japanese soprano singing the we may have a, a Korean or Chinese American or, you know, whatever. And so it, it then becomes <laughs> a whole other bag of questions. Are we doing justice by, um, you know, using Asian as a blanket statement to uh, produce this opera? I don't know. Um, but for me, taking all culture out of, of Butterfly does do um, the opera injustice. Yeah, thank you, Omar, for that question. Also, Phil and Nina for uh, commenting. I, I do also find them. Um, so I haven't seen this Welsh uh, opera production, so I can't say talk speak to a specific production. But uh, just by thinking about um, eliminating obviously Japanese references, Japanese culture, I think uh, the score itself has a lot of Japanese music in it, and I think. To me, if, if they get eliminated the textual element or you know, the staging element of Japanese-ness, um, if the score is the same, music is the same, it does create this dissonance between this kind of a reference, ghost kind of a, almost like a ghostly references to Japanese music or, and culture in the sound and then there's nothing on stage. So it, unless it's the kind of a, alienating effect that the, the product is somehow um, making use of. I mean, that, that might be potentially very interesting, but um, yeah, it, it does seem some, um, you know, I'm, I, I don't think ignoring <laughs> solves the issue that we're trying to solve here. So, so that, that's the point. Um, um, and on the point that Nina made about um, the you know, kind of a casting of Asian American, non-Japanese Asian American singers um, is that if, if we're, honest about the history of this work and kind of connecting to the world history of the production of this time, we have to think about the Japanese colonialism of Korea and Taiwan and in war in China and other parts. And, and, and so, so that the story even becomes even more complicated, but I don't think we should shy away from that. I, I think this is something that we really need to think about, you know, honestly, so respectfully to, to use um, Jack's word. I, I love this word respectfully uh, instead of authentic, authentically, because I, I think authentic, the quest for authenticity can become a goal on its own, kind of, you know, the people involved in it, but respectfully seem to suggest that we're concerned about the people who are uh, witnessing it and performing it and producing it. So thank you. I think this, this idea of authenticity also is problematic because you know, what is authentic Asian American culture? Is it just anything that an Asian person makes? So if you're a Japanese and you paint at Commedia dell'arte masks because that's what inspires you, you know, you're inspired by Italian Commedia dell'arte, does that mean 
just because you're a Japanese person who made it, that that's contemporary Japanese culture? I mean, yes and no, you know, it's it's not as black and white as as we do think. So if, uh, you know, when Nina sings Italian operas, is does that become, you know, Asian American art because it's coming out of her body? Um, and how does she express that? You know, so I think it's, it's definitely um, an issue that especially uh, immigrants and folks who are, um, you know, are questioning how much of our own heritage do we bring with us as it informs our work and how much do we just make work that is uh, sort of almost just human, um, you know, that's just as, as, as broad as possible in terms of our shared culture. So I think there's definitely layers to culture here that are complicated and make this conversation a little bit more nuanced. Thank you. Can, can I ask a question to the um, performers as well? So I, I'm very um, grateful for this opportunity to talk to you all um, who are engaged in the creation of this work and, and kind of bringing it to future. You know, I, I like many musicologists, I, I'm, I used to be a musician, right? so I play the clarinet and all that. So, and, 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 it, and I kind of understand the, the work that it goes into become, you know, performing and the kind of the struggles you have to go through to, to reach this stage. So I really respect your work and, and thank you for this opportunity. And, but I'm also excited the fact that I'm able to, you know, communicate with you all. And my question to you is that, uh, is there anything else that um, you want scholars like me to be exploring? <laughs> are there any question that you want us to explore more and kind of bring to the table so we can have this collaborative relationship? I yeah. have my own uh, selfish, uh, uh, I'm, I'm even more kids now here, here's another one. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's just like the, um, the, the tracing the evolution of it. It's, it, it's very interesting to me. I, I don't know if it's necessarily gonna inform performance of it as much as it's, um, <laughs> here's a unicorn phone. Uh, <laughs> this, is to, this is going to be, illustrative for the for the nature of the work and whether we should think of the artwork as a um, you know anti-racist thing or a racist thing I guess um, the, the the evolution of like removing a racist character is not necessarily anti-racist if you're just trying to paper over the fact that racism exists mm -hmm. but it, it could be uh, well it could first of all be positively um, <laughs> reflect positively on the culture of the time if, uh, if they didn't want uh, racist stuff on stage and they didn't think it was good. I mean, that's, that's good. If they didn't like the racist stuff on stage. <laughs> All right, Mackenzie, I think we have to turn it over to somebody else, but I would just like to know more about the, the process of the revisions and what, what they were based on. And you know, that was my question earlier. And I, I'm interested in that. I don't know if there's an audience for it elsewhere, but I'm interested in it. I will definitely look into it and let you know. <laughs> I wish I would have that cute on Zoom. Um, well, I, I just wanted to um, to thank everyone for for joining us today. I wanted to leave our, our audience with um, sort of one last question, and I guess just think about your favorite work of performing arts. So, not a movie, not a sculpture, not a painting. Your favorite live performance. It could be a play, it could be an opera, it could be a symphony, it could be a ballet. Um, just think about the evolution of that piece and how it started and how many different versions of it you have seen and what you liked about some versions and what you didn't like about other versions and why is that experience integral to your appreciating the performing arts what opportunities do we get when we get to see a, a, maybe a familiar show but with a different cast or maybe the lead character is a new gender or maybe the, the characters are suddenly cast as people of color, like in Hamilton. So what are some old stories, familiar stories that ring true when done with a slightly different way than the last time you saw it? And what richness perhaps do we gain by the fact that we in the performing arts get a literally a new show every time we all assemble on stage together? No two shows are the same. So just think about that um, as an overall theme, both of today's conversation, you know, in light of the, the history we learned today, um, but also for the future of how we keep, you know, the, our masterpieces, the, the pieces that do contain some really beautiful 
music or poetry or human connection um, alive for the next generation to better reflect who we are. So once again, I just wanted to thank everybody for joining us, thank the artists for participating. Of course, thank you again to Dr. Kuni O'Hara. Um, if you guys want more information, um, please feel free to reach out directly to BLO. Um, you can send your thoughts to access at blo.org. And also please stay tuned. Our next discussion series as part of this will be on Orientalism and cultural appropriation. That will take place on January 18th via Zoom webinar. So, and you can sign up for that now at blo.org. Um, also, I would be remiss in saying it is the end of the year. And so if you have a little bit of extra dollars laying around and you wanna be sure to support the arts, support the artists in your community, um, I'm sure the BLO folks would be very happy to receive a, an end of the year donation uh, from all of you. So once again, thank you so much for being a part of our community. Thank you for tuning in um, to be a part of this conversation and um, really looking forward to continuing to unpack this masterpiece with all of you in the community. Thank you so much, everybody.